On this week's episode of Local Matters, Julie interviews historian and archivist Carolyn Ravenscroft. We go on the local scene to Pembroke High School for the Credit for Life Fair. In our schools with Matt Umbriana, Keith Hughes brings us an all-new snapshot and events in our South Shore towns. I'm Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett. Let's get started. Registration is now open for the annual Bark in the Park Festival held at Nelson Park in Plymouth. This year, the Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce event that puts the wow in bow wow will be held on May 7th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. There will be live music the entire afternoon, a beer garden for humans, food, over 30 vendors, and activities for family members with both four legs and two. A blessing of the animals will take place from 11.30 to 1 o'clock by Dr. Pastor Paul Jaley, and your fur baby can even have their paw read by intuitive psychic medium and well-respected dog trainer, Kate Otto Masuch. That's from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. when the competition begins with a doggy costume contest and the announcement of the winner of America's hometown hound. Not a rough way to spend the day. Visit Plymouth Bark in the Park com to learn more. The Duxbury Rural and Historical Society envisions Duxbury as a welcoming community committed to embracing the significance and diversity of its historic and natural resources. Julie Thompson spoke with archivist and historian Carolyn Ravenscroft about what's new and next for the society. We are so pleased to be joined today by Carolyn Ravenscroft, who is the historian and archivist for the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's so nice to be here. Thanks for having me. It's excellent to have you. Can you give us a little brief bio on you and how you ended up being in this position? Sure. Great. I'd love to tell. Um, so growing up, uh, like most people who end up being archivists, I loved history. I loved being dragged around by my parents to various museums and reading historical fiction as a kid. Um, but after receiving my bachelor's degree in history, there's not much that most uh, history majors do. And so I had a variety of jobs until I went back to graduate school at Simmons University and got my master's in both archival work and history and ended up here in 2009. And I've been at the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society ever since, loved every minute. Oh, wow, that's excellent. So you've got a long tenure there. And can you just- I am currently the longest tenured person here. <laughs> <laughs> can you just tell, tell us what is an archivist? What, what does it take to be an archivist? Uh, so it's uh, very similar and akin to a librarian. Um, except what I take care of is not books. I take care of the manuscripts, diaries, letters, log books, old maps, things of that nature. So primary documents um, here at the Drew Archival Library of the DRHS is just a treasure trove of hundreds and thousands of, of collections and papers and photographs that I'm responsible for, not only caring for and organizing, but also making sure that researchers have access to them. Perfect, yeah, and I saw on your website, it's pretty amazing what the Drew Archive Library has. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Yes. So, yeah, for such a small town, we have an amazing uh, array of history here. Yeah, you really do. So the Rural and Historical Society takes care of buildings, lands, and history and mm -hmm. collecting. So can you talk a little bit about the difference and, and for example, the buildings? Okay, absolutely. Let me just take a step back and say that we were formed in the 1880s as one of the first land preservation organizations. We were originally called the Duxbury Rural Society and nicknamed locally the Rurals. And so the first thing that the Duxbury Rural Society did long before it even got into the history game was to do things to beautify the town and acquire land to keep open spaces. And uh, to date, we have over 100 acres of land around town. Um, and then we became a historical society. Around 1900, we started morphing into a historical society. And to that end, we um, 
manage four historic buildings. We have two house museums, the Bradford House on Tremont Street and the King Caesar House on King Caesar Road. Our main office is a beautiful three-story federal on Washington Street built by Nathaniel Windsor Jr. Uh, and we also have a lovely antique house on uh, Clark's Island in Duxbury Bay called Cedar Field. Um, and the archives that I'm sitting here in today release from the town. It's the original library of Duxbury. Okay, excellent. Now you also have, um, the, the, your, it lists land that you're responsible for and you said you're over 200 mm -hmm. acres of land. So it's little parcels. I think it's over a hundred. Oh. Yeah, so some are large, some are small. Some are as small as our Bumpus Park, which is on Duxbury Bay, which is a lovely spot that people get married at. Yeah. And we have another little piece right on Bluefish River called Maxwell Garden, Maxwell Reynolds Garden now. It's a lovely little spot to come and um, just uh, enjoy, enjoy nature. But we also have larger parcels like Round Pond, and that's beautiful walking trails around Round Pond. Um, so it runs the gamut from little tiny triangles of land yeah. in between like street intersections to something as expansive as Lapham Woods or Round Pond. Perfect. And you were responsible for maintaining all those lands. Well, thankfully not me personally. <laughs> we have an amazing <laughs> lands committee okay. uh, at the DRHS and they take wonderful care of our properties. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Now you do history and collecting. You collect objects, you collect, um, mm -hmm. you have the, the, you are here at exhibitions. Talk to me about the collectings mm -hmm. that you do and what you okay. do with those. So we are an institution that actively collects not only three-dimensional objects, but also documents. And so we are continually expanding our collection and we have thousands of objects with an amazing um, historic clothing collection and objects that go from um, the colonial period all the way to the 20th century. So the You Are Here exhibit was quite exciting for us. We were all locked down during COVID. People couldn't come to us. So we, uh, on exhibit panels, placed around town at places that people were still having access to, we married the history of that particular location with objects or documents in our collection. And so as you got out in the world as much as you could during those um, days, we still had contact with you. That's, that's an excellent idea. So people that may not have been exposed to that information, mm -hmm. you put it on, like you said, on panels. Yes, that's fabulous. and it lives on. It lives on today at the Senior Center in Duxbury. We put a uh, majority of the panels there. So if if you happen to be there, you can still read and see them. And then we have a handful here at the archives as well. It was just too good to. Oh, die. yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Use it twice. Why not? Now, recently mm -hmm. you did a tour of the Mayflower Cemetery. Can you talk about that? Mm -hmm. What the purpose was and sure. how many people? Um, so I think that Cemeteries are one of the best places to learn history. You're outside, you're, um, you know, so if you, if you don't like learning in a classroom kind of way, you get to be outside, you're moving around, and all sorts of stories can be told in a cemetery. So we do a few themed tours during the course of the year at our cemetery, the local cemeteries. Um, and yesterday's, the theme was Patriot's Day. So... We talked a lot about at various graves, life in colonial Duxbury leading up to the war, what life was like within the war, and then some of the soldiers' graves who fought in the war. So it was a beautiful day yesterday out there. Yeah. That's wonderful. And during the course of the year, especially now that we're hopefully mm -hmm. opened back up to the world, what kinds of things do you sponsor during the course of the year? Well, now that, I mean, knock on wood, right, everyone, right. that we're at the end of COVID. <laughs> um, this year, for the first time in two summers, our Bradford House will be open again on Tremont Street. And that's a house museum that's really close to my heart because when I came on board in 2009, it was called the Gershom Bradford House. And it told a lovely story of the sea captain who lived there. And it gave very uh, an abbreviated story of the amazing women that lived in the house. And in 2017, we relaunched the Bradford House, uh, we reimagined it as a women's museum 
telling women's 19th century history through the lens of the four Bradford sisters who lived in that house, um, telling their Civil War nursing stories, mm -hmm. abolition, uh, temperance, etc. even later life, their disabilities and aging. Um, and so we're really happy that that will be open again this summer. Um, and we will have a small exhibit new this summer in the house about shopping local, mm -hmm. Duxbury shopping in the 19th century. Our King Caesar house um, was open last summer and it will be open again this summer. That's a beautiful house on Duxbury Bay, built by one of the wealthiest and most important shipbuilders in Massachusetts uh, in the 19th century. Um, it's a gorgeous place to come and learn about some local and really regional history. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be open as well. That's wonderful. Yay. Yay. <laughs> now, do you have fundraisers or how do you, how do you get funded? So we um, have been around for a long time. So luckily we have a lovely endowment, mm -hmm. which I can't really speak much about. I've just heard about, uh -huh. <laughs> um, but yes, we, um, we do have some fundraisers in the fall. We're going to have a really great fundraiser that is just taking shape now. Um, and the theme for that one will be the gold rush, mm -hmm. 40 plus men from Duxbury headed out for the gold rush. So that should be a fun night. Sure. And that will be in our Nathaniel Windsor Jr. house. Um, and of course, a not fundraiser, but one of our biggest events is our King Caesar Christmas event, which has been going on for 50 years. This will be the 51st. Um, and that takes place um, usually the first or second weekend in December, and the house is decorated beautifully, yeah. and it's oh, just a wonderful party. Yeah, I remember seeing pictures of the decorating mm. the inside yeah. of that house. It's just pretty, pretty amazing. They decorate that. Yeah, better than I could ever. Right. right. <laughs> well, so there's there's a treasure trove of information um, on both your website and your Facebook page. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you so much for joining us today and what Thanks wonderful work me. you're doing. We really appreciate you being here. Well, it was my pleasure. Thank you. To attend events, tours, donate, or learn more, visit DuxburyHistory.org. It's a triple feature at the Blake Planetarium on May 12th. In More About Your Earth, From Earthquakes to Ecosystems, you will experience our ever-active planet through three programs. In Earthquake, Evidence of a Restless Planet, actor Benjamin Bratt narrates a breathtaking tour of historic seismic events. Ecosystems focuses on how plants, animals, other organisms, weather, and landscape work together to form an environment. Climate change in our backyard shines a light on how and why our climate is changing, traveling through ancient Antarctic ice bubbles to the Colorado Rockies and home to our own backyards. This event is co-hosted by Plymouth Public Schools Science, Technology, and Engineering Department. Visit the Eventbrite page to get your tickets. Matt Umbriana is up next with what's happening in our schools. The Pembroke Special Education Parent Advisory Council will hold a presentation at the Pembroke Public Library on Monday, May 2nd from 6 to 7 p.m. The topic is Understanding Children's Behaviors. Kim Mossman of the Mossman Play Therapy Center will focus on the science of the nervous system and the role it plays in manifesting behavior. Visit Pembroke CPAC Facebook page for more information. Pembroke Kindergarten Information Night will be held in person at Bryantville Elementary School on May 3rd at 6.30 p.m. Kindergarten registration is now open. To review the process, please visit PembrokeK12.org. Every 10 years, high schools undergo an accreditation process with the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. Pembroke will host an accreditation visiting team in the fall of 2024, and to prepare is looking for feedback to see how well it meets the needs of students and families. Parents and caregivers interested in participating in the survey can visit the high school page on the district website and click the survey link in the April 8th weekly update. Earlier this month, Guidance counselors visited junior English classes at Silver Lake High School to discuss the college search process. Parents were also invited to a separate evening presentation on the topic. If you missed it, you can view it, the presentation through the Guidance Department page at slrhsguidance.blogspot.com to view it. Under the College Planning tab, you will also find other informational presentations for parents of sophomores, juniors, and seniors. 
Did you know that Silver Lake High School has a podcast? Capsize looks at what's happening at the school and what's important to the students. Listen to episodes of Capsize on the library page of the Silver Lake District website. That's what's happening in our schools. I'm Matt and Brianna. Back to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Matt. In-person exhibitions are back, and the Plymouth Center for the Arts announces the Fine Art of Photography 2022, its 12th annual juried exhibition and competition, showing from May 1st until June 4th. Doors open at 3 p.m. on Sunday, May 1st, with a reception and award ceremony that is free and open to the public. There will be live music and light refreshments. Visit PlymouthGuild.org to learn more. Navigating the real world after high school is tough, but the recent Credit for Life Fair held for graduating seniors from Pembroke High School aimed to make financial literacy easier to understand. The local scene was there. The Credit for Life Fair is an exercise that high school students can go through where they actually pretend they're 25 year olds and dealing with their personal finances really for the first time. So they get to pick a career and then they visit several booths or stations where they have to find an apartment, furnish an apartment, pick a health care plan, uh, pick a vehicle or a mode of transportation. Well, I think it was really positive actually. I learned a lot more about credit scores, some more about some finances regarding like household, daily needs, like health and wellness because it's important to have insurance and know what you're putting your expenses towards. The Credit for Life Fair is an opportunity for students to participate in an event that they have to make financial decisions. Imagine themselves in their mid-twenties and now they're living on their own and they have to go to 10 different booths and make decisions such as renting an apartment, um, purchasing their first car. They have to think about insurance. They have to think about a retirement. So it's a number of decisions that their parents may have taken care of that for them in the past, and now they're faced with these financial reality. That I have to have my own Netflix account when I leave the house, um, that was definitely a shocker, you know. Well, I noticed that on some of my, when I was going through, I had something popped up and said that I got into a car accident, and I had some unexpected expenses that I had to pay for that because you can't always uh, account for what's going to happen. And, you know, it's always unpredictable. So it kind of keeps you on your toes a little bit and it shows you kind of like how your budget can change unexpectedly for things that you don't really go through it on an everyday basis. After Credit for Life Fair, I think I want the students to take away the fact that life can be expensive and that they they're not immune from thinking about their finances. I think that we try to protect our children a lot from thinking about um, life choices as financial choices, but we're not really doing anyone any favors by doing that because life choices do have financial consequences and they're ready to learn, they're eager to learn, and if they're in control of the situation, they're likely to make a pretty intelligent choice if they know their choices. I learned about the real life consequences of buying items like an apartment or a car and spending money. You know, as a person with a job, I'm aware of, you know, having a salary but not necessarily putting it in the perspective of an adult lifestyle. So it's nice the way that they sort of gamified this experience of buying and spending money, but knowing that it's not just a game, like you said, but understanding as well that we have to take it seriously and learn about using our debit card versus our credit card. One thing that we were excited about here at Pembroke High School is that Rockland Trust um, sponsored this program and we were so excited to have um, these individuals that dedicated their time and volunteered to bring this fear to Pembroke High School that it wouldn't have happened without them. So Rockland Trust deserves a big kudos and we're thankful for that. So Rockland Trust has been a part of Credit for Life Fairs for years and we're so excited to be at Pembroke High School where Kim McKenna, one of our my colleagues and our employees, has been really involved in this school for several years. Because she lives in the community, her children have gone here, and because she's in banking. So she really understands the fact that this experience can create opportunities for students to learn. And at, at the bank where each relationship matters, we really pride ourselves in believing that your relationship with money is very important. And we want everybody at all ages to have a healthy relationship with money. So this gives students in high school to have that opportunity. So I work at Rockland Trust. Uh, I work for the International Services Group. I am a big proponent of financial literacy in the high schools. So I live in Pembroke 
and it made it only sense that I have children that have come through or are still at Pembroke High School and we're giving them a little financial education. That you have to take good care of your money or you will end up in a bad situation that you'll probably just keep digging yourself in a bigger and bigger hole. So if you take good care of your money, you'll, you'll probably be happy. I think it's very important to keep up and document what you're actually spending so that you can track it each month so that you know you're not going to go over what you um, are taking in so that you're not going into debt. So I feel like having um, being in college gives you an added level of independence. So having that independence, but now I feel prepared that I'll be able to handle myself as well. A drum circle creates a sense of joy, connectedness, and equality. A circle has no head or tail. Teaching artist Cornell Coley facilitated a hugely popular drum circle last year at the Kingston Public Library, and the library is pleased to announce his return on Saturday, May 7th at 2 p.m. The event will take place in the library meeting room and will kick off the new KPL live music series, Music at the Library. This free event is sponsored by the Kingston Public Library Foundation. To register, visit the library's website. Next up is Keith Hughes with an all new Snapshot. Welcome to Snapshot, where we take a local look at the government stories that you may have missed. The skyline in North Plymouth will change beginning the week of May 9th with the demolition of the iconic 210 foot smokestack at Cordage Commerce Center. Building Inspector Nick Mayo presented the emergency need for demolition to the Plymouth Select Board, citing extensive safety concerns determined by a land survey and evaluation. The Town of Plymouth, in conjunction with the Cordage Commerce Center and the Plymouth Community Preservation Committee, will reveal plans to memorialize the 123-year-old landmark at a later date. At the April 11th Duxbury Board of Selectmen meeting, representatives from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, along with the Duxbury Board of Health, provided a presentation to help educate the public about PFAS and on drinking water and the water cycle, water testing, finding PFAS, how to treat it, and more. You can view the meeting and presentation online at PACTV.org under the meeting coverage tab, and you can also read the presentation online at the town's website on the Board of Health page. At the April 5th meeting of the Kingston Select Board, the Sewer Commission presented an update on the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan, an update required by the State Department of Environmental Protection as part of the Wastewater Treatment Plant expansion. The management plan will assist the town in managing water resources while meeting current and future needs. Visit KingstonMA.gov to view the presentation online under the Wastewater Project section on the Sewer Commission page. You can also watch the presentation as part of the Select Board meeting online at PACTV.org on the meeting coverage page. If you're planning to do some boating this summer, it's a good idea to take a boating safety course. You can find the course schedule online at mass.gov under the Massachusetts Environmental Police page. Local courses will be offered in both Pembroke and Plymouth in May. Register online for these classes offered for adults and those 12 years of age and older. Family participation is encouraged. Summer heat can bring water restrictions which can impede watering your garden. The Town of Plymouth is offering residents the opportunity to participate in the 2022 Rain Barrel Program, where you can purchase a rain barrel online and pick it up at the Plymouth DPW in Camelot Park. The deadline to order is June 9th, and you can pick up your order Saturday, June 18th, between 10 a.m. and noon. To find out more, check out the town's Facebook page, Town of Plymouth MA. The town is also looking for people to be poll workers for the town election on May 21st. If interested, you can find the application on the town's website under the Human Resource Department. With the last of the local elections occurring in the upcoming weeks in Pembroke and Plymouth, you can visit PACTV's YouTube page, PACTV Video Share, to view candidate statements and interviews to help you become a more informed voter in your local election. Thanks for watching this edition of Snapshot. I'm Keith Hughes, and we'll see you next time. Boston's LGBTQ archive, The History Project, invites you to start celebrating Pride a month early with Improper Bostonians, 400 plus years of LGBTQ people, community, 
Organizing and Change in Massachusetts. This in-person event takes place Monday, May 16th in the Merry Room of the Duxbury Free Library and will cover four centuries of rich cultural LGBTQ history in Boston and the Bay State. Find more information on the Duxbury Free Library website. Are you a senior who has recently moved to America's hometown? The Center for Active Living has so much to offer, including an embracing and heartfelt welcome. You are invited to join America's Hometown Welcome Club, an opportunity to meet other seniors new to the area and share valuable information that can be helpful as you settle into your new town. Refreshments will be served at the next club meeting on May 5th at PCAL, beginning at 10 a.m. Call the center at 508-830-4230 to say you'll be there or for more information. And that wraps up this episode of Local Matters. Visit the local scene on YouTube, social media, or our website for more of what's good and good to know in our community. From all of us at PAC TV, have a safe and happy week. We will see you next time. Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to The Local Scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.